Well, good. Well, Rich, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, we have Rick Kalis of uh, uh, Rainfire Ranch down in Ravensdale, Washington. And we were joking, uh, not, not the most well-known town in the world. I know it because years ago when I was in news, I filmed the Tough Mudder event and they do that down in uh, the old, there's like an old coal mine or something that they do around there. Uh, yeah. So why don't you introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what you do? Okay, thanks, Reed. Uh, so my name is Rich Kalis. I am the owner-operator of Rainfire Ranch. Uh, it's a 45-acre former horse ranch uh, that we converted back in 2012. Um, and so since then, we've become kind of one of the premier venues in the South End, the Southeast End. And um, so, yeah. Yeah, and I've certainly, you know, I know we've met at the wedding shows and, and seen each other around, and I know that you send in video as well for our big WSWEA, um, you know, event video. So I got to see some wonderful, I've seen wonderful video from your property, you know, both at the wedding show and just obviously online. Um, beautiful spot. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about kind of what you guys have going on in terms of a venue, just from an aesthetic standpoint? So, yeah, so... I mean, we're really lucky. We actually are in this amazing valley. Um, we're about, so to give you a perspective, we're about 45 minutes from downtown Seattle and 45 minutes from downtown Tacoma. Now, to be clear, that's when there's absolutely no traffic. So yeah, we all know how that goes these days. So we're in this valley. Um, on one side is Sugarloaf Mountain, and on the other side is, uh, side is Mount McDonald. Uh, Sugarloaf Mountain, our property goes back a third of the way up the hillside. I'm looking off to the left here because I'm looking out a window at it right now. Um, and then above that's actually a King County Forest Preserve. And then on the other side of the valley, Mount McDonald is actually uh, Washington State Department of Natural Resources. So we're in this amazing valley that's not going to, you won't, you know, the thing about us is that we're more than 200 yards off the main road, so you don't hear a lot of car noise. And also, it's super private. We're on 45 acres. And so when people book here, they really get a sense that people aren't sort of eavesdropping on their wedding. They really have a lot of space. Uh, the venue is very, as I refer to it, it's very saunterable. Um, once you sort of get past sort of the key moments, and it's more just like the party side, a lot of people can walk around and kind of see our venue as a whole. So, yeah. Um, we do have indoor and outdoor capacity. Um, we have a reception barn, which is actually what I'm sitting in right now. Uh, but we have also an outdoor ceremony area. Um, we have a fire pit. Uh, we have a guest arrival area. Um, and so, yeah, it's over the years we've evolved it and, uh, you know, been happy where it's gotten to. And it's, I mean, people ask me, you know, what's it like to be in the wedding industry? I was like, you know what? It's probably one of the most stressful industries I've ever been in, but it's also probably one of the most rewarding because watching people just, you know, enjoy the space has actually been really rewarding. So, yeah. What kinds of couples like to, to get married there? Obviously the barn look, outdoor. I mean, what kind of, um, you know, weddings and things do you guys find yourselves holding there a lot? You know, the sort of, you know, from a marketing standpoint, the three sort of marketing keywords that we go for is unique, memorable, and relaxed. Um, we want people to come here where, yeah, it's a celebration, but it's also a time to kind of, uh, you know, just enjoy the moment. And there's usually, it's not, you know, we definitely don't aspire for the bride that, that wants to have their guests and their wedding party to dress to the nines. Um, but I think that one of the things that's also good about us is that we can go, we can get to that point. But we also, I mean, we've had people dressed in tuxes, um, but we've also had people dressed in like, you know, camo vests with uh, shotgun shell boutonnieres. Um, and then the brides that book here, I think, are the ones that, that are not only appreciate nature, but the vibe of it. Some of them really like it because it's of how, what our outdoor looks like and that the barn's sort of an added plus, but then sometimes it's the other way around where they really like the barn feel. The barn feel that sort of, we try and mesh it with a certain level of elegance, but you know, no matter what, it's always gonna be a barn, so yeah. As someone that you know owns a venue that is that barn look, do you, do you enjoy that? I mean, it, it's so interesting to me how popular it's gotten just, I mean, and it's never gone away. It's always, I mean, ever since I've been in the wedding industry, it's so people love the country weddings, the barns. I mean, what do you, as someone that owns one of them, what do you, what do you think of that? Um, I mean, I enjoy it. I mean, obviously I feel like our business is successful. Um, I think that even if I was in like an old brick and mortar, you know, 
facility. I actually think it's more, I just enjoy, I've found that I'm enjoying the wedding industry. I actually do come from a creative background. Um, I used to be a creative director. I'm also a graphic designer. And what I found is that sometimes those skills really help in working with couples because there's usually in identifying sort of how the team input works. There's usually a decision maker, a major advisor, minor advisor, and then we appreciate your opinion, but thanks very much. Um, but, <laughs> but so... I, I mean, obviously I've lived here for 20 years, so I've actually spent the majority of time, my time here not having it being a venue. Um, we used to raise racehorses and do horse training. Um, we actually have used to do a number of fundraiser events out here. Um, I live here with my husband, George, and so we actually have done a lot of fundraising for um, a shout out for uh, Lambert House, which is an LGBTQ resource center up on Capitol Hill. Um, I, so... It's kind, of, it's kind of all over the board. But I do feel that with the popularity of barn venues, I think that it actually has gone through an evolution. Before, at the very beginning of it, you know, 10 years ago when barn venues were becoming popular, I think it was more of a fact of kind of getting back to a historical, a prior sort of simpler life. But I think that's actually evolved into not only a prior simpler life, but I mean, I've seen barn venues that you can take them to be truly, you know, country and incorporate, you know, burlap and straw and that sort of stuff but i've also seen barn venues taken very vintage where it's like lace and sophistication but still sort of rooted in history um i mean we even did have one wedding that was really based around the 1920s so we had a lot of gold and a lot of black and uh, it was a really kind of interesting mix of those couple of things so yeah What's interesting uh, too about you is uh, you're very involved just in the wedding community, right? I mean, I know you're involved in, in, in the wedding kind of organizations. You know, I see your name pop up a lot, you know, at the wedding show. <clears throat> is that something you guys, because, you know, some owners or some venues just kind of exist or people go, and, but, but I mean, people know Rich, they know Rich of Rainfire Ranch, you know, they know you guys. I mean, what, talk about just that mentality of, of really, you know, putting yourself out there and the venue and just being involved in kind of that network working in that community uh ho hopefully it's on good terms and not <laughs> you know my name in infamy yeah uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know I, I don't know i guess it comes back from the fact i mean i'm a fairly extroverted person um and so i like i like the camaraderie that comes from working with peers uh and so and i do think too that you know like how, what's a good reference? When I'm talking with my couples at the end of a tour, I will sit there and talk to them about, okay, we have three different paths to go. The first two have to do with booking the venue, but the third path, I tell them, I say, like, you know, the third path is that if you do decide to book someplace else, you're obviously not required to let me know that you're not booking here. But I say, if you email me and say, hey, we've decided to book someplace else, thank you for your time. I tell them you're going to get three nice comments back. First comment is congratulations. I mean, we all want to work with couples who want to work with us. There's nothing worse than having a couple that obviously doesn't want to work with you, right? So I'm glad that they found a place that they feel is going to fit them the best. The second question I asked them is, where did you end up booking? You know, I, I tell them, I was like, you know, I just want to know where people are going in, in contrast to us. If it's a place that I already am aware of and I know the owners, which we do obviously know a lot of the same, you know, know a lot of each other. I tell them, I was like, you know, if I know it's where, if I know where you're going, I have a trust and confidence that they're going to take good care of you. If it's someplace I've never heard of before, I'm going to get on the internet. I guess what I'm saying by that comment is that, you know, we as an inter, we as a community rise with each other. If we have a strong community that knows that as peers, we are sort of paying attention to each other and we are, we are cordial with each other and we support each other in a way that, um, helps us as the greater community, that means everybody rises. Um, I've been, uh, I've helped out other venues get up and running, which I've, I've had a few people question me, like, why do you do that? And uh, as corny as it sounds, I explained to them, like, yeah, of course they're competition, but every different, we I mean, the, the luxury of the wedding venues is that every different wedding venue is distinctly different. I mean, even if you have two barn venues, they both are very, going to be uniquely different. So I explained to people is that, yes, they are my competition, but really I try and look at my competition as to what I was last year. How have I evolved over this year? How have I worked to fine tune my product that I'm offering couples so it actually fits 
the progression of a wedding and a reception as best as possible. So, yeah. Well, and especially when it comes to the venues, you know, you're really, you got one, one day that, you know, one wedding a day, you know, I mean, it really is trying to just, like you said, make sure they're going, if they don't decide to book with you, that they're going somewhere that they're going to be taken care of, right? That they're, it's they're not going to worry about some weird stuff going on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I look back, I mean, George and I joke about it. We, we've even have talked with a few of our couples that uh, were some of our first couples. We just saw one just the other day and we said, Hey, if you guys, I mean, we think about how we were back eight years ago and we're like, wow, would we have even ever booked there? No, <laughs> but you know, it's just one of those things where you just acknowledge the fact of what are the, you know, where are you trying to go? I think that at the point where we would say, you know what, we're good. We don't want to make any more evolvements in the venue. Then we probably should get out of the business. So, but so far we're still, we, we have things on the horizon line, even in this sort of uncertainty of coronavirus, we have some things on the horizon that I'm really excited about. So, so, so you said you guys you know, have been there a long time, right? It hasn't always been the venue. What, what was the impetus to kind of get into, you know, jump into this wedding community, you know, for lack of a better, you know, I blame my bookkeeper and she's really good. So if you need a bookkeeper, I will give you her name. But uh, no, I blame her for like over a decade, seriously, over a decade. She was like, you should do weddings. You should do weddings. Uh, she, you know, produced her own wedding. She produced her to her sister's wedding. And then she produced two other weddings. So she knew what she was doing. And so when she saw sort of the raw setting here prior to us even evolving it, she kept pushing on doing it. So then in about 2011 is when we really decided, okay, what do, what's the pro how is the property working for itself? What do we want to do with it? And so it was, we actually just, so that's when we decided to, can, to transition into a wedding venue and then to come find out that we actually had a number of actually close personal friends that were already in the wedding industry quite a bit. Um, uh, Dave Mextrith with Tuxedo and Tennis Shoes, uh, Liza Reagan with uh, Choice Linens, she's with Court now, um, Phil Sternola, who was a wedding planner, and then I think he's actually with uh, City, City Wave, City Link, City Wave, one of the DJ photo booth companies right now. So yeah, so that's how we started down that path. It, initially, we were just offering the venue. We weren't as involved as what we are today. We have a lot more offerings that kind of are much more more involved in the overall process. Yeah. Did you guys ever have any idea getting into this? How, how kind of, cause the wedding, you know, I mean, entrepreneurship and obviously you guys had stuff before, but you know, entrepreneurship in the wedding industry, dealing with couples. I mean, it is just a very involved, I, I've always made the joke on the podcast. Like you probably wouldn't text your plumber like at 10 o'clock at night and be like, Hey, I really need you know, whatever, but you would text like your planner or your photographer or whoever. I mean, the wedding, you know, wedding entrepreneurship is, you know, a definitely a full time above and beyond anything. So, yeah, definitely. You know, I don't think, I mean, so as I said, I've been involved in a couple of different other industries and I don't think I've ever been in an industry that's so uniquely from its core, really sort of this continuous educational moment. You know, I tell couples, you know, most likely you've never gotten married before, let alone even produce a big party. And so they're looking for people to sort of guide them, but soft handedly, you know, um, and I, I joke with them. I was like, you know, any vendor worth their salt is going to be in that sort of educational mode and sort of being assisting them through that process. I said, lean into that. They're there to help you. And I said, you know, we're already pretty salty as it is at the age of 57. So. <laughs> Uh, so did you, I mean, was there a big learning curve getting involved in this? And, and, and I have, especially too, you know, where if you've had a property and you've, you know, had whatever, and then having to, you know, change things or improve things or, you know, I mean, what's it been like kind of going through this whole process? I think, so we first, I mean, obviously our first couple of weddings, we did have a contract. I, we have a, we've had a corporate council we've worked with for a number of years. And so, Want to make sure they're crossing the T's and dotting the I's. I think that they, I mean, the blind, the blind spots were pretty numerous, though, across those first couple of years. I think after our first couple of weddings, I think there was one year where we had 16, like, major contract edits that we adjusted our contract that basically clarified, we do this, we don't do this, you can do this, you cannot do this. No, I'm sorry. In the future, you cannot bring 15 pallets with you on the day of the wedding and stack them in our fire bonfire pit and light them. No, you can't do that. <laughs> but we will supply the wood in the future. So, so yeah, there's definitely a learning curve. Um, it's definitely a type of thing where 
in talking with, you know, other uh, venue owners as they've developed um, their properties and that sort of stuff, try and just giving them some advice, even though every different situation is unique and every different owner kind of comes at it with a different tool set. Um, I know some wedding planners who have actually transitioned into actually being venue owners. And it's interesting to hear their feedback come back from that sort of transition and that situation. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be. I, I remember like two years ago, I had a wedding and I had to add a clause into like the editing and all of that about what I was going to, you know, in terms of like the editing their video. And I was like, man, I wouldn't, I really wouldn't want to know that like I was the client that had to have whatever clause or whatever put in another contract because I was, you know what I mean? Like I would like to kind of think that I was in line with what most other people were expecting, you know? And just different things. I mean, like I, we always, you, you sort of look up, you sort of look back and you think, oh yeah, I was sort of relying on people's sort of good judgment that I didn't have to have this clause in the contract. Like, you know, no, you're not allowed in any pasture that has livestock in it, you know, things like that. As I had a couple, they were a lovely couple, but they convinced the photographer to go with them into one of our pastures with our horses and, uh, and take photos with them and the horses. And it was like, I mean, I just saw the liability exposure rolling through my head and uh, I, I pulled the photographer. And of course, on the wedding day, you're not going to blare at the bride or the groom. So you pull the photographer aside. And I, I mean, I'm six foot three. I'm a big guy. And I, I tried to hold myself back. But I know that these two young ladies who are ex exceptional photographers, I mean, they're really good at what they do. But I was just like, you do not understand what you just opened anyway. So, yeah. So then we had to end the contract. You cannot go to any pastor with livestock in it. So. Uh, you know, you said you've made a lot of changes over the years. What are you most proud of in, in terms of how you've built something out, you know, big work that you guys have done, or, you know, maybe a big project. I mean, what do you, as you have owned this venue forever, you know, even before it was a venue, you know, what are you most proud of just in terms of what you guys have done to improve everything? Um, a couple of things. I mean, obviously I'm sitting in the reception bar and that was a big transition for us. When we first started the venue, we were doing reception tents um, I mean, we're blessed that we have a lot of space. I mean, we actually, one year, we had a 120-foot-long tent. It was kind of crazy. But um, the reception bar in transition was a huge one for us. It actually just made our job so much easier because it was contained, concrete floors, just a little bit easier. The other one that I think, and I've talked, uh, every once in a while, I, have an, I get an opportunity to talk about branding and that sort of thing. I do really feel accomplished and happy with how we've sort of established the brand of Rainfire Ranch and sort of what, you know, the things that people say, or as I say, you know, your brand is what people say about you behind your back when you're not listening. Right. Um, and I do feel really good about that brand and how we've evolved it and how it's sort of been adopted and, and people's understanding of it. Obviously this, this season has been difficult because, um, of coronavirus and what we have been able to do and what we haven't been able to do with kind of reacting to people's desires. I'll leave it at that. You probably, <laughs> we've all weathered through it. Um, but I do feel strongly as to what our community support is. Um, we, I'm a member of a number of local community organizations uh, as well as the Chamber of Commerce. We, we try and be supportive and, you know, just, you know, so, yeah. So the branding is a second one. Um, what else? I actually feel like I've successfully navigated this business with my husband, which being in business with your husband or with your partner is, it can be a challenge, but as time has gone on, we've sort of uh, figured out where each of us is the decision maker and then the major advisor and trying to navigate through that process. And it's, it, even though it can be really difficult and i Looking back on a relationship, most of our fights have to do with the business side, not really our personal side. But um, I do feel it's given us a better product. I think that people come on the venue and they can definitely identify where George's hand touches are and where my hand touches are. So, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't imagine running a business with with my wife, Dorothy, that I we were trying like... Two years ago, we were trying to get this um, like a toy kind of scavenger hunt thing going for her. She does a lot. She's a teacher, and you know, we're trying to start this whole project. And then, you know, obviously, we t time got busy. And then uh, with uh, COVID and everything, and she was at home, and we had one conversation about kind of restarting it, right? She goes, hey, maybe we could go do that. 
<laughs> and 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 it lasted for about 10 minutes. And I was like, yep, that is your thing. Like, you do not want me to be, you know, because it's just totally, It sometimes it's really hard. Uh, photographers, videographers, whoever, husband, wife, partners working together, trying to own a venue. I mean, I can just imagine that it could be challenging, right? If you guys didn't have all that. Yeah. So the thing is that you sort of, you know, when you were an entrepreneur, you sort of get used to just doing whatever you want. Right. <laughs> and when the lines of what it is that you do sort of get blurred and it's very intermeshed, it, you know, well, I want to do this. Well, I want to do this. And so then how do you kind of figure that out? And um, yeah, but uh, I feel like we've handled it pretty successfully. I'm more the face of the venue, but he definitely is present in the background and, and people do usually know him. When people come and they see the gardens or they see the landscaping, uh, they, yeah, I always remind them, oh, this is George. He, he's, the, he's the stronger hand on the landscape side. So, uh, You talked before about you're proud of your brand and that's what people say about you got, you know, what, about a business when you're not around. What do you feel is your brand and what do you hope that people say? And I, I'm sure they do good things because all I hear is good things about, you know, your property. But what... <laughs> But talk to me about, you know, the brand that you're, what is that brand that you're proud that you've built? So we, you know, we had a hard time. So I sort of feel like our brand represents the fact that, you know, you, if people want to book a venue where when they walk in from the point that they walk in, they don't feel rushed. They feel taken care of. They feel there's definitely two people on site that are paying attention and that, it's also very team oriented. I mean, anybody, even people who haven't come here and vendors who haven't come here and worked here before, I, rep, I, I feel the role of branch planning manager usually. And so I want to make sure that those vendors feel like it's a team effort because really the success of a wedding is when it, it works as a team, not with one vendor trying to prove themselves above another vendor to the bride, you know, you don't want to prove yourself at the same time where you're sacrificing that relationship with your other vendor because, you know, it's just, yeah. So we do, where I feel that that is a core part of our brand. Um, uh, yeah, I think those are the main things. So. How did you come into this property that we have, even like you said, even before it was a wedding venue, how did you guys come to you know live and own and, and be here? So uh, some people, some people in the industry are, you know, my background, but um, if you, so I was in 1990, I was one of the charter members of a game company in Renton called Wizards of the Coast. Um, they produced Magic the Gathering, uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, they also were the producer of uh, Pokemon, the card game for North America and Europe. Uh, in partnership with Nintendo, which actually had the master license, which was garnered from out of Japan. Pokemon originally uh, came out from Japan. So um, being a charter member of this game company that was actually fairly successful, uh, it actually had a steeper growth curve than Starbucks. Um, uh, it released a card game called Magic the Gathering in 1993, which took off. Um, it's now, I think it's translated into like something like 30 different languages uh, across the globe. Uh, so throughout that process and then eventually selling to Hasbro, I did, you know, did fairly well. And so I sort of turned around and made the decision that I wanted to kind of move, move on to purchasing a property. And that's how we ended up with the property, um, back in 2001, actually celebrating 20 years in March. I always feel old now when I say that, but it's pretty, I mean, I, I look back and, you know, it hasn't all been, you know, rose rose petals and and loveliness here but i feel that i definitely have hit my stride in kind of just life and what we're doing here so um so that's kind of how it started when i first bought it <clears throat> um we did start doing horse racing um while at the same time i actually took on a uh, creative consulting role at hasbro.com uh to relaunch hasbro.com for them um, from a creative standpoint, that was back in 2002, I believe, and then did that for like seven years. So it's just I've kind of you know meandered my way through. I mean, when you, when you look back at life, you're like, ah, kind of <laughs> but yeah. So, but I really, I mean, people joke that this is the ranch that Pokemon built. So, 
That's uh, yeah. I had no idea. I yeah. I used to play magic and had the. Uh, I remember the Wizards of the Coast store over in Bellevue at the. I used to grow grow up by the mall there, and there was a little story. But my uh, that's fascinating. My assistant Matthew, they still play magic every. He's always playing. He and um, two of my assistants were both homeschooled, and so they met together and they have like community groups. And uh, I mean, I think they play like four nights a week. I mean, they just can't. They always want me to come. And I'm like, uh, you guys, you don't want me. I do still play Dungeons and Dragons. So are you, uh, when you were involved in that, was it more of the creative brand? I mean, what what was your involvement in that? Um, So when I, so when we started the company, I mean, it's a joke when we started the company, we were tossing out VP titles left and right. And I think at that time I was vice president of production, um, but I mean, it really didn't mean anything. Uh, but then as time kind of went on, um, I, I stepped away from the company for a little bit of time. And then when I went back to 1995, I started off as a graphic designer in the marketing department. And then after that, they consolidated all the design components into the art department and then not long after that, I was actually the first art director that worked on the organized play portion of Magic the Gathering. You know, they're actually having tournaments and that sort of thing leading up to a world's championship. And so I was sort of the first one to sort of forge what that looked like from a visual standpoint. And then eventually um, in 1997, I after we were without a creative director for about nine months, which was really kind of challenging, um, I actually applied for that. And so I was... Um, I took over the role as creative director. <clears throat> and then a little bit after that, um, I was promoted to VP. Although I did work for that one. That title was not tossed to me. I actually worked very hard for that. Um, and then eventually I left the company actually in 2000 um, after the acquisition of Hasbro. Um, and so then, so yeah, that's how I started. So it was more on the creative side. So like all the art directors for Magic, all the all the people that were like commissioning the card art and doing the graphic design uh, reported to me once I took over as creative director. That's so. fascinating. What what a, what a weird world uh, weird world that we live in that we're talking about. That's so funny. It, it's funny. I mean, I'm very fortunate. I mean, it's not very often that you can say, "Hey, let, you know," because it was my friend Peter Atkinson who was the president in 1990. He's like, "Hey, I want to start a company, and we want to do." game design and we want to show tsr how this is really done and and just do good good game design well as you know then as magic was created and became popular eventually we actually acquired tsr which is uh the company that did magic the get or did dungeons and dragons out of lake geneva so i got to work with some of the people that i had been playing with their i'd been playing with their game content and their art since like 1975 so yeah i remember um not to segue too much into my own stuff, but uh, we, <laughs> no, uh, my, my dad was in advertising, my dad passed away, but he was in advertising. And when he moved his company up from, it was him and like his boss and they moved their company up from uh, Portland to here. And he was getting some people signed on that they were starting off in Kirkland. And he was trying to hire this guy and it was, he was going to be like the number three at their company. And they go, yeah, you know, there's this guy named Bill Gates that's really doing this, uh, you know, really, really interesting stuff. Like, I think I'm going to go work for him, you know, as a most. And I'm like, yeah, why couldn't we have been on the other side of that conversation and not the guy that my dad was trying to hire? You know, like, it's just weird how the world and like, it's all kind of interconnected. It's fascinating. Oh, yeah. I have a I have a friend. I've not been in touch with him for years, but this uh, he was a little bit younger than I was in high school. His name was Mark Singer. He went to the same high school I did and he got out of high school and actually went to start working for this small company up in Seattle, Microsoft at the time. And so I just, I can't even imagine where he is now. He's probably owns an Island somewhere in the other part of the world, but uh, really exceptionally smart, but yeah, it's funny how it just different. It touches, you know, and the thing is that those sort of contacts and sort of, you know, retrospective points of your life there, they they become more and more there's more and more as you get older and older so yeah do, do you enjoy that that gaming aspect like you said you still do dungeons and dragons i mean do you enjoy that it's a different mindset kind of do it i mean you like that still obviously right oh yeah definitely um so recently just in this last year 
I, so I do have a Steam account. Steam is basically a, uh, an online game serving per system. Um, and so I downloaded Risk. And so I actually play Risk in the morning now because it's, it's nice because it's a very sort of resource strategy game. But it's sort of, it's sort of, you don't have to put a lot of mental cognitive to it, but you can sort of block out the rest of the chaos that's going on out here. And you can just sort of play the game and you can, you know, basically dominate the world how you want. You know, without anyone else's input, you can sort of dominate the world. And so I play that like three times a morning and have my tea or my coffee and, and then, okay, I'm ready for the day. Now I can deal with all you other people. Uh, something that's more of a, uh, I don't know, philosophical question, just as, you know, as someone, you know, you have like this whole other world, right. And now then, you know, like it, that's almost like it's a separate life, right? I mean, it, it obviously all continues, but it's really like a lifetime ago. And I always think about that where like, I've been doing this wedding video thing for, you know, six, seven years. Right. And maybe in another 20, I'll look back and go, Hey, remember that time when I was like a wedding videographer, wasn't that crazy? Like, what has it been like going through these different stages in your life and looking back and just, what is what is that like? It just it has to be interesting to have conquered and, and moved on and done so many different things. Um, wow, Reed, I sound old, don't I? No. <laughs> uh, so no, I mean it definitely. It's nice to feel like you can sort of make your past lives <laughs> smaller term. Yeah, but it's nice that you can sort of apply, make those that that knowledge base applicable as you move forward. Um, I mean, I, because of the fact that I was, you know, I managed creative people because managing creative people has a whole different sort of tenor to it than sort of managing technical people. But um, so I do feel that that does a, is applicable towards what how weddings kind of work, because there's a sort of intensity of creativity that's going on. You sort of have to kind of manage it and manage expectations and manage budget and sort of, and I, and I definitely am not, I mean, that's definitely much more of like a full wedding planner's job, but on the lighter touch of it, I guess I do some of that, but um, it is, I sort of feel like, I feel like I've been successful because one of the things I do is I go into a situation. First of all, I don't assume that I know everything because I most likely don't. Um, so I try and keep my mouth shut and keep my ears open, uh, be open to ideas. But then I, I know that as time goes on, I'm going to sort of formulate my own opinions and then sort of set my own sort of direction and set my own sort of like, this is how I want to do things. And then just sort of move into it and just say, okay, well, I think we could do this better this way based on past experiences. One of the things that I would recommend to, to any person who's showing a venue who may be listening to this podcast is that, you know what? You walk your couples through your venue. You talk to them for a good 35 to 40 minutes explaining how your venue works. And even if you've already sent them a PDF or your, your information is on the website, give them a packet. Even if it's just a marketing card and your price sheet and maybe a little bit more information, give them something to take away. It drives me a little bit crazy when I hear venues, uh, when I hear from couples who've been to other venues who say, yeah, we got there. And they just said, well, here's the venue. I'm like, what a lost opportunity. Talk with these people because... The thing we try and explain to people is that not only do you want to see the venue and really see your wedding there and, and, and know that the aesthetic is fitting for what you're looking for, but you're also, you're also setting up to work with the people who've just shown you around the venue. So I do think that that's one thing that's really that, – that I've sort of kind of evolved into the fact of, you know, really talk to your venue, explain how it all works. At the same time, knowing that they may say, well, we want to – we want to have a celebratory fire lighting and that, that we want that to be part of the day and have it be, you know, have it be a moment. We can make that work. So, yeah. Does well, that answer your question? Yeah. Well, no. And also where you guys are, are just a little more hands-on, right? I mean, some venues, it's like that you just don't, and, and there's, and there's pros and cons and everything to all sorts of, you know, it's not better or worse, but it is, you, you guys have pride, right? And you know, it's nice when you have the people that ha have seen how it works 
Because then, you know, as the couple goes in, like you said, they don't know what's going on. They've never done it before. And you go, well, you know, this, these are things that we've seen that people have had success. Oh, okay. That makes sense then. As opposed to just like, well, here's a blank wall, like put something on it and they don't know where to start. I mean, it's also a situation too, that we live on site. So that actually sort of drove that sort of, let's be more hands-on. The, the comment I made about the 15 pallets that they stacked in a bonfire pit, you know, that was like, wow, yeah, do we really want this? No, you know, we don't really want this, especially if we're like in the middle of August. I mean, <laughs> so definitely learned. Uh, but yeah, I do know that we're known for being more hands-on. And, but I do know that there's definitely a, a negative side to that. Um, and we have dealt with that at times. Uh, you know, some couples have been like, well, we don't want to do this. We want to do this. And we're like, you can do that. I mean, we try and be very clear. So, yeah. And I think that being clear is actually how we've actually avoided a, some of the, you know, the first question, I'm sure you get the question too. Oh, do you, how do you deal with bridezillas? And I'm like, well, you know, first of all, I start from the mindset of, is it okay for a couple to want what they want on their wedding day? Of course it is. They should ask for the moon. They should ask for everything. I always think that if I ever have to say no, I need to follow it up with a logic-based reason as to why I'm saying no. Because usually if you, if you say no, and then this is why most every couple is like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, why don't you allow sparkler send offs? Well, this is an all wood structure. We have a lot of grass around here. And uh, although I trust your guests after they've been drinking, not to burn you on their way, your way out, then what happens when you guys are gone? That's the, so yeah. Yeah. It's, I, it is always appreciated though, when it's more of like, a question than when it's like, um, you know what I mean? Cause we all, cause you do get like, I know I get self, um, defensive, you know, people have questions about like how the video stuff works, how the editing drag, you know, it's, it, it's easier to ask, like you said, like why, or how can we do it versus like, well, this is what we want. Like, I don't know. It's a, it's a little, it's a little bit of the tone. Sometimes it's helpful just to like approach it in a little more, you know? Yeah. We had a, a live stream like wedding this year and she was like, yeah, we were going to do their ceremony for like 20 minutes. And she's like, well, you know, my sister is in uh, somewhere in Europe and, and you know, w w could we live stream like the four hour like thing after? And I'm like, well, that's a little bit more intensive to do like a 20 minute thing or like, I'm not, I don't like to say, I'm not saying the answer is no, but I'm saying like we would drastically need to rethink the events of like your day if you wanted that to be a possibility. So like you said, it is, you don't like to say no, it's, you like to follow it up with something that's, I think that's a good way to handle it. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we're fortunate, you know, the one thing that I found very interesting about this industry is that each different vendor category, the challenges are just so completely different. And the business model is so completely different that it's, it's, you know, they're almost like, I mean, they are technically separate, different businesses, but they're all like these slices of this pie. It's like, if you were to get, you know, they had those, those like cheesecake pies where every different slice is a different, a different flavor. That's what the wedding industry is kind of like. Um, so yeah. Uh, I, so Interesting. Uh, as someone that, you know, obviously uh, had a totally different, you know, business, everything before, and then kind of entering this wedding world, what has it been like just kind of being a part? I, I've said on the podcast before, knew nothing about weddings at all. had no friends that had got married ever when I started kind of doing all this. What was it like kind of entering this, you know, potentially foreign world? Uh, definitely... Definitely my vocabulary changed and the approach to my vocabulary changed. Um, you know, you just sort of, you just sort of have to, ch it's, you know, you want to be conversational when you're talking with couples, but you really have to be careful what you say. You know, as I'm walking through the tour, we talk about how the bride enters and so prior to me being a little bit more seasoned, um, I would say, so this is where you and your father will come walking in from. And I, and I literally, I hit it. I hit that misstep hard as the bride starts crying and letting me know that her father passed away four months prior. And I was just, I mean, I was three inches tall. I felt so bad. And just, and it's just like, and you sit there and you just mentally kick yourself and say, you dumb, 
<laughs> so I really, you, I sort of really feel that how your vocabulary sort of changes um, and how you sort of speak changes with in, as you're in context, as you know where those dangerous points those danger spots are. So now it's always, even if their father's standing right there, I always start out and say, so are you planning to have anybody walk you in? And then let her decide. And then it sometimes can be sort of a humorous moment because it's like, you know, because then the father will look at her and then she'll look at their father. Or he'll look at the father. You know, it can be kind of, so anyway, the vocabulary has been talking about that. You know, I coming up with the term ranch planning manager used to be call myself ranch coordinator, you, you know, does not work. You know, what those, what day of coordinators and wedding planners do is very different from what we do. So just that sort of thing. Um, there was another thing I was thinking about too. Now I can't remember, but. Well, especially with, like you said, with the vocabulary, even just with brides and grooms. And I, like, I always try to say like the couples, you know, planning, cause it's not all, you know, it's, it's not always too bride, you know, bride and groom. It could right. be. Exactly. And, and I all like, and, and, you know, if I ever on the podcast, please anyone ever call me out. Like I always try to say like, you know, the wedding couple, you know, the couple that's planning the wedding because the couple, you know, it could be anything. Right. But it's so, it, you want to be so uh, just respectful of everybody, right? You want to be so, and like you said, you you don't know if if, the, if it's her father or if that's her uncle or if there's, or maybe she doesn't want her father to walk her down and that is her father. And you don't, you know, you, we just don't know what's going yeah. on. So when referendum 74 passed, uh, because George are an openly gay couple and we're, I think we are like one of the only owner and operated gay, gay owned and operated venues. Um, I know there are other venue owners out there that are gay, but they aren't necessarily hands-on. Um, but uh, because of that, I had a lot of other vendors, heterosexual vendors, reach out to me and say, help us. How, you know, how do we speak? How do we address people? And I said, well, the first thing you want to do is just never assume as to who's getting married. So if you have a group of people walk up to you, say, okay, who's getting married? And they'll let you know. And then the other thing I wish I felt was very important is that, you know what? Gay, same, gay people are people too. They know that you'll make a mistake. The thing is just own up to it. Don't try and gloss over it. Don't try and be overly apologetic. But just say, oh, I apologize. You know, misconceptions. Let's just move forward. Because your genuineness of your apology and just keeping it short and straight to the point, they will get that. And if, if they are comfortable and they're willing to move forward, then it actually is a win-win. Now, you know what? I, I personally know that there are some gay people that take a very extreme offense if someone makes a mistake and refers to the bride and groom or refers to the groom and groom or the bride and bride. And so, and the thing is that if that, if that, person or that couple is going to take that severe of uh, offense to that mistake, then maybe you're not the best fit for them and you should just move on. So yeah, I've, I've done it myself, you know, I, you know, showing to a lovely lesbian couple around and here I am gay myself and I make, I make that faux pas. It's just, you have that conditioning. So I, you know, that was uh, another thing, as you've mentioned, the whole same sex marriage aspect. The thing that's funny about same-sex marriage thing, marriage weddings, that I think is interesting is that all rules are off. I mean, literally, all rules are off. They, there's, there's very little sort. I mean, there's, there's, you know, certain sort of tenets that are in heterosexual weddings that sometimes apply, but then there are a lot that just don't even. So I just tell people, you know what? Just throw all those things behind you. You can pick and choose what you like, but you know. You know, like when people like when a same sex couples are walking up to the ceremony pavilion, I sometimes say you could both walk up at the exact same time and we'll put a we'll do two chairs on either side. Then we'll leave a little gap so that you actually are walking not on the aisle. You come together and then get married and then you walk out together on the aisle. So we've done that a couple of times and there's other just sort of like just combinations. So. Well, just, yeah, I mean, it's, I worked in, I was still at Q13 when all that passed, you know, we covered all that when uh, gay marriage was legalized. So like that, I have never been in the wedding industry in Seattle where that wasn't a thing. Right. So it's, it's just, everyone has their own backgrounds and where you come into it, but like, that's never not been allowed. So it's, it's even for me to be like, Oh, well, I didn't even, Oh yeah, there was a, you know, it's just, it's, it's everyone approaches it differently. Yeah. So trying to be as you know inclusive as possible. So. 
Can I can I get political for a minute? Yeah. So we're at a scary time uh, as the gay community because you know back in 2015 the Supreme Court ruled that nation nationally wide gay marriage was to be recognized. Well, now with the makeup of the Supreme Court, uh, two very conservative Supreme Court justices have just today, literally, have said, we need to review this decision from 2015 about gay marriage. And if the appointments of the court does skew conservative, which there's a possibility it could, basically everybody who was afforded the right as a same-sex couple to get married could have those rights taken away. As an over 50-year-old man, uh, you know, both George and I had put the concept of getting married out of our heads. You know, it's not something that we really, we really, because we never thought it would happen. So it's like, you know what? I'm not going to bang my head against that wall. I mean, yeah, we'd have our opinion about it if it come up, but we never thought that it would get to that point. But then the others of our community that were pushing that envelope, that got that referendum 74 passed in Washington state. Once it passed, the first thing that struck my mind is like, wow, how much of a second-class citizen I was being treated as, that I didn't have the opportunity, that I didn't have the opportunity to ha- get married with the person who I am in love with, to, to be afforded, uh, you know, that sort of institution. Now, you know, the wedding that we had was not a religious ceremony, but we aren't trying to take away from other people's religious ceremonies. We just, we just want to have a similar opportunity. So... I just it scares me right now with as to what the the that that this question is being brought up again and that we could find I could you know we could find ourselves in a very short period of time um having those rights removed. So anyway, moving on. Thank you for my opportunity and my soapbox. Well, I know I do think that would be very scary. And I, I guess it, yeah, I mean that just puts even the naivety in me where here I am like and now you're saying you know it could go away again, right? And it's like it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I know I had to go, um, when that whole thing went, was going on with the baker in like Ellensburg, the, that whole, and it went and it, like, I had to go, I was, I can't remember what I covered with that at Q13, but I had to go out and, and try to interview some people or something about that whole thing. I mean, just how crazy that whole thing got and where they weren't going to make the cake. And then it ended up going to the, I think it went to the Supreme court about all that stuff for, I mean, that was a huge I, deal. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not exclusively yeah. versed in it, but yeah, yeah, but just you know, now with this on um, with this next replacement for the Supreme Court, there it just is. It's so polarizing. Yet I, yeah. So anyway, it's a little bit disconcerting. So keep that in mind when of your same set or your gay friends when you're yeah. considering that. Uh, I was going to ask kind of my last question that I really wanted to touch on is just in terms of uh, kind of everything you guys have done over the last, you know, owning the venue, owning the property, I just uh, the, the most uh, accomplished you felt, you know, what, what have you guys, what do you feel most proud of? It, it could be you know, personally that you guys have done or business wise and accomplishment. I mean, what do you feel like uh, to have gone through and, and accomplished so much in your, in your life? What do you, what do you hang your hat on? And it could be a couple things. Uh, whole life or wedding industry life? Take it either way you want. That's a really good question. Meaning that it's hard to for me to. Yeah. <laughs> so one thing that I one thing that recently I talked about it actually about a year ago um, on a podcast with from my gaming history. So when I took over as creative director, the there was definitely a schism between Wizards of the Coast and the illustrators that were working for us because the rights that they were afforded were really not that great. I mean, these are contracts that were developed back when the game was not really as popular as what it was at the time that I took over as creative director. And so one of the things that I did help in when I was creative director, but a lot as well as the senior art directors I was working with, the senior art director for Magic was reworking what the artists really could take away, giving them a much greater sense of monetization of the success of what their artwork brought. 
um, which really wasn't there initially. So I do feel that was actually one of the things that I, that I, I wasn't, obviously it was a team effort, but I do feel really strongly that they were much better represented and the process just was cleaner. Um, so yeah, that's, so that was one thing. Um, obviously taking the ranch to a point where it was recognized and where it is today and where we are going in the future. I'm really proud of that. Um, there was one time that we were in the finals of the best of Seattle bride magazine <laughs> for best outdoor wedding venue. And we were up in the finals with the Lil sellers and I think Willow's lodge. And I was just like, <laughs> and the general manager of DeLille was there and she actually accepted because DeLille won and she accepted your, the award, but I chatted with her. I think I can't remember if it was before or after, but she's like, she was, I was actually rooting for you. And I'm like, I was like, you know what? I'm just glad to be in the category in the finalists. I was sort of, I mean, because I've been to both of them, and it's like they're both exceptionally amazing. So I was, I, if, if anything, it made me sit there and think to myself, okay, I need to get my together and really step up our game. But um, that was nice. Um, I don't know. But, but, I mean, as much as, as corny as it sounds, you know what? Unsolicited bride hugs are the best. The best. Um, when they just, you know, they're so appreciative and they just sort of, you know, out of nowhere come up and give you a hug and so yeah um and there are others i guess i don't know <laughs> like i said it's a good question and then you start thinking about it hmm, what do i what have, what have i accomplished well yeah so, what have i well and, and you know it's tough because like i said it's just kind of you know pick a one or two i mean there's just you can go down the line that you know sometimes it's just everything that you've seen and all the big wins and the little wins. And I mean, they all kind of add up to where we are. Everything know? I do is fabulous. Just to be clear, everything I do. <laughs> hey, wait, here, there's a visual with that. Ready? Yeah. Everything I do is fabulous. <laughs> so, sorry. I'm just a big, I'm just a big kid at heart. So. Well, this has been great. I mean, I'm so glad that we got to connect. I'm so glad that you reached out and that we, you, you commented on my post. I was trying to, we had, had a big round of, I have like six of these recorded and then they all aired. And then I thought, Oh my gosh, I need to get some more of these going. So I uh, thank you so much for reaching out. I'm so glad. Cause like I said, I've, you know, I've seen you at the shows and, and, and the wedding uh, like meetings and stuff. I'm so glad to connect and kind of hear a little bit. I had no idea about, you know, your backstory and your history and, it's just that that's what's so nice about this podcast, right? Is people see each other all the time. And we just don't know, you know, and this is just one sliver of everything, you know, an hour of anyone's time is just a sliver of anything that they have to say, but it is nice that, that we got to connect and, and spend that time. No, I appreciate it, Reed. You know what? These are, I, these are awesome. It's just nice. Again, same thing in return. We'll just have to focus on finding a time that we can work together. But uh, it's nice just to kind of take a break and, and get a chance to talk about things sort of in general and in a conversational term. And uh, yeah, so if, if I will look forward to see you in the future, hopefully at one of the networking get togethers or if I mean, I am planning to be at the Seattle Wedding Show. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I know, although I know it's going to be different, but um, yeah, I'm very approachable, even though I'm six foot three and I usually have a beard and facial hair. I am approachable. Just come up and slug me in the shoulder, not too hard. Uh, yeah. So, and uh, uh, before we go, uh, plugs for website and social media, anything you want to get out? Uh, yeah. So, rainfireranch.com. Um, we have an Instagram account, which is a little bit more sort of behind the scenes and sort of focused a little bit on family. Um, we, <laughs> we, <laughs> We have animals that have Facebook pages. There's Petunia at Rainfire Ranch. She's our mobile mule. She's our mule to part of our mobile mule bar. Uh, our two cats actually have a Facebook page called Wally and Molly at Rainfire Ranch. Um, we have a Twitter account, which I don't touch ever. Uh, so, yeah. And we normally do have... Um, I know, oh, should I even share this? So we normally do have a great Halloween party that it's a private invite only party but if anyone is interested in being on the invite list uh, let me know we aren't having it this year though of course so well perfect uh well thank you so much again this has been a delight it's been really fun to catch up thank you Reed. appreciate it we'll talk to you soon yeah if you're like rich you're interested in coming on the podcast you can go to bestmadevideos.com slash podcast guest and that's a nice easy questionnaire to fill out to get you in the system and uh thanks again this has been another episode of get to know your wedding pro all righty thank you <laughs>